Giant Maximin 1. The Coming of Giant Maximin Many are the strange vicissitudes of history. Greatness has often sunk to the dust and has tempered itself to its new surrounding. Smallness has risen aloft, has flourished for a time, and then has sunk once more. Rich monarchs have become poor monks. Brave conquerors have lost their manhood. Eunuchs and women have overthrown armies and kingdoms. Surely there is no situation which the mind of man could invent which has not taken shape and been played out upon the world stage. But of all the strange careers, and of all the wondrous happenings, stranger than Charles in his monastery, or Justin on his throne, there stands the case of giant Maximin. What he attained, and how he attained it. Let me tell the sober facts of history, tinged only by that colouring to which the more austere historians could not condescend. It is a record, as well as a story. In the heart of Thrace, some ten miles north of the Rodope Mountains, there is a valley which is named Harpessus, after the stream which runs down it. Through this valley lies the main road from the east to the west, and along the road, returning from an expedition against the Alani, there marched, upon the fifth day of the month of June in the year 210, a small but compact Roman army. It consisted of three legions, the Jovian, the Cappadocian, and the men of Hercules, Ten termi of Gallic cavalry led the van, whilst the rear was covered by a regiment of Batavian horse guards. The immediate attendants of the Emperor Septimius Severus, who had conducted the campaign in person. The peasants who lined the low hills which fringed the valley looked with indifference upon the long files of dusty, heavily burdened infantry but they broke into murmurs of delight at the gold-faced cuirasses and high brazen horsehair helmets of the guardsmen, applauding their stalwart figures, their martial bearing, and the stately black chargers which they rode. A soldier might know that it was the little weary men with their short swords, their heavy pikes over their shoulders, and their square shields slung upon their backs, who were the real terror of the enemies of the empire. But to the eyes of the wandering Thracians, it was this troop of glittering Apollos who bore Rome's victory upon their banners and upheld the throne of the purple-togued prince who rode before them. Among the scattered groups of peasants who looked on from a respectful distance at this military pageant, there were two men who attracted much attention from those who stood immediately around them. The one was commonplace enough, a little grey-headed man with uncouth dress and a frame which was bent and warped by a long life of arduous toil, goat-driving and wood-chopping among the mountains. It was the appearance of his youthful companion which had drawn the amazed observation of the bystanders. In stature, he was such a giant as is seen but once or twice in each generation of mankind. Eight feet and two inches was his measure, from his sandaled sole to the topmost curls of his tangled hair. Yet for all his mighty stature, there was nothing heavy or clumsy in the man, his huge shoulders bore no redundant flesh, and his figure was straight and hard and supple as a young pine tree. A frayed suit of brown leather clung close to his giant body, 
and a cloak of undressed sheepskin was slung from his shoulder. His bold blue eyes, shock of yellow hair and fair skin, showed that he was of Gothic or Northern blood, and the amazed expression upon his broad, frank face as he stared at the passing troops told of a simple and uneventful life in some back valley of the Macedonian mountains. "'I fear your mother was right when she advised that we keep you at home,' said the old man anxiously. "'Tree-cutting and wood-carrying will seem but dull work after such a sight as this. "'When I see mother next, it will be to put a golden talk round her neck,' said the young giant." And you, Daddy, I will fill your leather pouch with gold pieces before I have done. The old man looked at his son with startled eyes. You would not leave us, Thecla? What could we do without you? My place is down among yonder men, said the young man. I was not born to drive goats and carry logs, but to sell this manhood of mine in the best market— there is my market, in the Emperor's own guard. Say nothing, Daddy, for my mind is set. And if you weep now, it will be to laugh hereafter. I will to great Rome with the soldiers. The daily march of the heavily laden Roman legionary was fixed at twenty miles. But on this afternoon, though only half the distance had been accomplished, the silver trumpets blared out their welcome news that a camp was to be formed. As the men broke their ranks, the reason of their light march was announced by the Decurians. It was the birthday of Geta, the younger son of the emperor, and in his honour there would be games and a double ration of wine. But the iron discipline of the Roman army required that under all circumstances certain duties should be performed, and foremost among them, that the camp should be made secure. Laying down their arms in the order of their ranks, the soldiers seized their spades and axes and worked rapidly and joyously until sloping vallum and gaping fossa girdled them round and gave them safe refuge against a night attack. Then, in noisy, laughing, gesticulating crowds, they gathered in their thousands round the grassy arena where the sports were to be held. A long green hillside sloped down to a level plain, and on this gentle incline the army lay, watching the strife of the chosen athletes who contended before them. They stretched themselves in the glare of the sunshine, their heavy tunics thrown off, and their naked limbs sprawling, wine cups and baskets of fruit and cakes circling amongst them, enjoying rest and peace, as only those can to whom it comes so rarely. The five miles race was over, and had been won, as usual, by Decurion Brennus, the crack, long-distance champion of the Herculeans. Amid the yells of the Jovians, Capellus of the corps had carried off both the long and the high jump, Big Brebix, the Gaul, had outthrown the long guardsman Serenus with the fifty-pound stone. Now, as the sun sank towards the western ridge and turned the Harpessus to a ribbon of gold, they had come to the final of the wrestling, where the pliant Greek, whose name is lost in the nickname of Python, was tried out against the bull-necked Lictor of the military police a hairy Hercules, whose heavy hand had in the way of duty oppressed many of the spectators. As the two men, stripped save for their loincloths, approached the wrestling ring, cheers and counter-cheers burst from their adherents, some favouring the Lictor for his Roman blood, some the Greek from their own private grudge. And then, of a sudden, the cheering died, Heads were turned towards the slope away from the arena. Men stood up and peered and pointed, until finally, in a strange hush, the whole great assembly had forgotten the athletes and were watching a single man walking swiftly towards them down the green curve of the hill. 
this huge, solitary figure, with the oaken club in his hand, the shaggy fleece flapping from his great shoulders, and the setting sun gleaming upon a halo of golden hair, might have been the tutelary god of the fierce and barren mountains from which he had issued. Even the emperor rose from his chair and gazed with open-eyed amazement at the extraordinary being who approached them. The man, whom we already know as Thecla the Thracian, paid no heed to the attention which he had aroused, but strode onwards, stepping as lightly as a deer, until he reached the fringe of the soldiers. Amid their open ranks he picked his way, sprang over the ropes which guarded the arena, and advanced towards the emperor, until a spear at his breast warned him that he must go no nearer. Then he sunk upon his right knee, and called out some words in the Gothic speech. "'Great Jupiter, who ever saw such a body of a man?' cried the emperor. "'What says he? What is amiss with the fellow? Whence comes he? And what is his name?' An interpreter translated the barbarian's answer. He says, great Caesar, that he is of good blood, and sprung by a Gothic father of a woman of the Alani. He says that his name is Thecla, and that he would fain carry a sword in Caesar's service. The emperor smiled. Some post could surely be found for such a man, were it but as a janitor at the Palatine Palace said he to one of the prefects. I would fain see him walk even as he is through the forum. He would turn the heads of half the women in Rome. Talk to him, Crassus. You know his speech. The Roman officer turned to the giant. Caesar says that you are to come with him, and he will make you the servant at his door. The barbarian rose, and his fair cheeks flushed with resentment. I will serve Caesar as a soldier, said he, but I will be house servant to no man, not even to him. If Caesar would see what manner of man I am, let him put one of his guardsmen up against me. By the shade of Milo, this is a bold fellow, cried the emperor. How say you, Crassus? Shall he make good his words? By your leave, Caesar said the blunt soldier. Good swordsmen are too rare in these days that we should let them slay each other for sport. Perhaps if the barbarian would wrestle a fall. Excellent, cried the emperor. Here is the python, and here Varus the lictor, each stripped for the bout. Have a look at them, barbarian, and see which you would choose. What does he say? He would take them both? Nay, then, he is either the king of wrestlers or the king of boasters, and we shall soon see which. Let him have his way, and he has himself to thank if he comes out with a broken neck. There was some laughter when the peasant tossed his sheepskin mantle to the ground and, without troubling to remove his leathern tunic, advanced towards the two wrestlers. But it became uproarious when with a quick spring he seized the Greek under one arm and the Roman under the other, holding them as in a vice. Then, with a terrific effort, he tore them both from the ground, carried them writhing and kicking round the arena, and finally walking up to the emperor's throne, threw his two athletes down in front of him. Then, bowing to Caesar, the huge barbarian withdrew and laid his great bulk down among the ranks of the applauding soldiers, whence he watched with stolid unconcern the conclusion of the sports. It was still daylight when the last event had been decided and the soldiers returned to the camp. The Emperor Severus had ordered his horse, and in the company of Crassus, his favourite prefect, rode down the winding pathway which skirts the Harpessus, chatting over the future dispersal of the army. He had ridden for some miles, when Severus, glancing behind him, was surprised to see a huge figure which trotted lightly along at the very heels of his horse. Surely this is Mercury as well as Hercules that we have found among the Thracian mountains, said he with a smile. Let us see how soon our Syrian horses can outdistance him. 
the two Romans broke into a gallop, and did not draw rein until a good mile had been covered at the full pace of their splendid chargers. Then they turned and looked back, but there, some distance off, still running with a lightness and a spring which spoke of iron muscles and inexhaustible endurance, came the great barbarian. The Roman emperor waited until the athlete had come up to them. "'Why do you follow me?' he asked. "'It is my hope, Caesar, that I may always follow you.' His flushed face as he spoke was almost level with that of the mounted Roman. "'By the god of war, I do not know where in all the world I could find such a servant,' cried the emperor. "'You shall be my own bodyguard, the one nearest to me of all.' The giant fell upon his knees. "'My life and strength are yours,' he said. "'I ask no more than to spend them for Caesar.' Crassus had interpreted this short dialogue. He now turned to the emperor. If he is indeed to be always at your call, Caesar, it would be well to give the poor barbarian some name which your lips can frame. Thecla is as uncouth and craggy a word as one of his native rocks. The emperor pondered for a moment. If I am to have the naming of him, said he, then surely I shall call him Maximus, for there is not such a giant upon earth. Hark you, said the prefect, the emperor has deigned to give you a Roman name since you have come into his service. Henceforth you are no longer Thecla, but you are Maximus. Can you say it after me? Maximin, repeated the barbarian, trying to catch the Roman word. The emperor laughed at the mincing accent. Yes, yes, Maximin, let it be. To all the world you are Maximin the bodyguard of Severus. When we have reached Rome, we will soon see that your dress shall correspond with your office. Meanwhile, march with the guard until you have my further orders. So it came about that as the Roman army resumed its march next day and left behind it the fair valley of the Harpessus, a huge recruit clad in brown leather with a rude sheepskin floating from his shoulders marched beside the imperial troop. But far away in the wooden farmhouse of a distant Macedonian valley, two old country folk wept salt tears and prayed to the gods for the safety of their boy, who had turned his face to Rome. 2. The Rise of Giant Maximin Exactly twenty-five years had passed since the day that Thecla, the huge Thracian peasant, had turned into Maximin, the Roman guardsman. They had not been good years for Rome. Gone forever were the great imperial days of the Hadrians and the Trajans, gone also the golden age of the two Antonines, when the highest were, for once, the most worthy and most wise. It had been an epoch of weak and cruel men. Severus, the swarthy African, a stark, grim man, had died in faraway York, after fighting all the winter with the Caledonian Highlanders, a race who have ever since worn the martial garb of the Romans. His son, known only by his slighting nickname of Caracalla, had reigned during six years of insane lust and cruelty, before the knife of an angry soldier avenged the dignity of the Roman name. The non-entity Macrinus had filled the dangerous throne for a single year, before he also met a bloody end, and made room for the most grotesque of all monarchs, the unspeakable Heliogabalus, with his foul mind and his painted face. He in turn was cut to pieces by the soldiers, and Severus Alexander, a gentle youth, scarce seventeen years of age, had been thrust into his place. For thirteen years now he had ruled, 
striving with some success to put some virtue and stability into the rotting empire, but raising many fierce enemies as he did so, enemies whom he had not the strength nor the wit to hold in check. And giant Maximin, what of him? He had carried his eight feet of manhood through the lowlands of Scotland and the passes of the Grampians. He had seen Severus pass away and had soldiered with his son. He had fought in Armenia, in Dacia and in Germany. They had made him a centurion upon the field when, with his hands, he plucked out one by one the stockades of a northern village, and so cleared a path for the stormers. His strength had been the jest and the admiration of the soldiers. Legends about him had spread through the army and were the common gossip round the campfires of his duel with the German axeman on the island of the Rhine, and of the blow with his fist that broke the leg of a Scythian's horse. Gradually he had won his way upwards, until now, after a quarter of a century's service, he was tribune of the Fourth Legion and superintendent of recruits for the whole army. The young soldier who had come under the glare of Maximin's eyes or had been lifted up with one huge hand while he was cuffed by the other had his first lesson from him in the discipline of the service. It was nightfall in the camp of the Fourth Legion upon the Gallic shore of the Rhine. Across the moonlit water, amid the thick forests which stretched away to the dim horizon, lay the wild, untamed German tribes. Down on the river bank, the light gleamed upon the helmets of the Roman sentinels who kept guard along the river. Far away, a red point rose and fell in the darkness a watchfire of the enemy upon the further shore. Outside his tent, beside some smouldering logs, giant Maximin was seated, a dozen of his officers around him. He had changed much since the day when we first met him in the valley of the Harpessus. His huge frame was as erect as ever, and there was no sign of diminution of his strength. But he had aged nonetheless, the yellow tangle of his hair was gone, worn down by the ever-pressing helmet. The fresh young face was drawn and hardened, with austere lines wrought by trouble and privation. The nose was more hawk-like, the eyes more cunning, the expression more cynical and more sinister. In his youth, a child would have run to his arms, now it would shrink, screaming from his gaze. That was what twenty-five years with the eagles had done for Thecla, the Thracian peasant. He was listening now, for he was a man of few words, to the chatter of his centurions. One of them, Balbus the Sicilian, had been to the main camp at Mainz, only four miles away and had seen the Emperor Alexander arrive that very day from Rome. The rest were eager at the news, for it was a time of unrest, and the rumour of great changes was in the air. "'How many had he with him?' asked Libyanus, a black-browed veteran from the south of Gaul. "'I'll wager a month's pay that he was not so trustful as to come alone among his faithful legions. He had no great force.' replied Balbus, ten or twelve cohorts of the Praetorians and a handful of horse. Then indeed his head is in the lion's mouth, cried Sulpicius, a hot-headed youth from the African Pentapolis. How was he received? Coldly enough. There was scarce a shout as he came down the line. They are ripe for mischief, said Labianus. And who can wonder? when it is we soldiers who uphold the empire upon our spears, while the lazy citizens at Rome reap all of our sowing. Why cannot a soldier have what the soldier gains? So long as they throw us our denarius a day, they think that they have done with us. Aye, croaked a grumbling old grey beard, 
our limbs, our blood, our lives. What do they care, so long as the barbarians are held off and they are left in peace to their feastings and their circus? Free bread, free wine, free games, everything for the loafer at Rome, for us the frontier guard and a soldier's fare. Maximin gave a deep laugh. Old Plankus talks like that, said he. But we know that for all the world he would not change his steel plate for a citizen's gown. You've earned the kennel, old hound, if you wish it. Go and gnaw your bone and growl in peace. Nay, I'm too old for change. I will follow the eagle till I die, and yet... I'd rather die in serving a soldier, master, than a long-gowned Syrian who comes of a stock where the women are men and the men are women. There was a laugh from the circle of soldiers, for sedition and mutiny were rife in the camp, and even the old centurion's outbreak could not draw a protest. Maximin raised his great mastiff head, and looked at Balbus. Was any name in the mouths of the soldiers? he asked in a meaning voice. There was a hush for the answer. The sigh of the wind among the pines and the low lapping of the river swelled out louder in the silence. Balbus looked hard at his commander. Two names were whispered from rank to rank, said he. One was Ascenius Pollio, the general, the other was... The fiery Sulpicius sprang to his feet, waving a glowing brand above his head. Maximinus! he yelled. Imperator Maximinus Augustus! Who could tell how it came about? No one had thought of it an hour before, and now it sprang in an instant to full accomplishment— the shout of the frenzied young African had scarcely rung through the darkness when from the tents, from the watchfires, from the sentries, the answer came peeling back, Ave Maximinus! Ave Maximinus Augustus! From all sides men came rushing, half-clad, wild-eyed, their eyes staring, their mouths agape, flaming wisps of straw or flaring torches above their heads. The giant was caught up by scores of hands, and sat enthroned upon the bull necks of the legionaries. To the camp, they yelled, to the camp, hail, hail to the soldier Caesar. That same night, Severus Alexander, the young Syrian emperor, walked outside his Praetorian camp, accompanied by his friend Licinius Probus, the captain of the guard. They were talking gravely of the gloomy faces and seditious bearing of the soldiers. A great foreboding of evil weighed heavily upon the emperor's heart, and it was reflected upon the stern, bearded face of his companion. "'I like it not,' said he. "'It is my counsel, Caesar, that with the first light of the morning we make our way south once more.' "'But surely,' the emperor answered, I could not for shame turn my back upon the danger. What have they against me? How have I harmed them that they should forget their vows and rise upon me? They are like children who ask always for something new. You heard the murmur as you rode along the ranks. Nay, Caesar, fly tomorrow, and your Praetorians will see that you are not pursued. There may be some loyal cohorts among the legions, and if we join forces... A distant shout broke in upon their conversation, a low, continued roar, like the swelling tumult of a sweeping wave. Far down the road upon which they stood there twinkled many moving lights, tossing and sinking as they rapidly advanced, whilst the hoarse, tumultuous bellowing broke into articulate words, the same tremendous words a thousandfold repeated. Licinius seized the emperor by the wrist and dragged him under the cover of some bushes. Be still, Caesar, for your life be still, he whispered. One word and we are lost. Crouching in the darkness, they saw that wild procession pass. 
The rushing, screaming figures, the tossing arms, the bearded, distorted faces, now scarlet and now grey, as the brandished torches waxed or waned. They heard the rush of many feet, the clamour of hoarse voices, the clang of metal upon metal, and then, suddenly, above them all, they saw a vision of a monstrous man, a huge, bowed back, a savage face, grim, hawk eyes that looked out over the swaying shields. It was seen for an instant in a smoke-fringed circle of fire, and then it had swept on into the night. Who is he? stammered the emperor, clutching at his guardsman's sleeve. They call him Caesar. It is surely Maximin, the Thracian peasant, in the darkness the Praetorian officer looked with strange eyes at his master. It is all over, Caesar. Let us fly together to your tent. But even as they went, a second shout had broken forth tenfold louder than the first. If the one had been the roar of the oncoming wave, the other was the full turmoil of the tempest. Twenty thousand voices from the camp had broken into one wild shout which echoed through the night until the distant Germans round their watchfires listened in wonder and alarm. Ave! cried the voices. Ave, Maximinus Augustus! High upon their bucklers stood the giant and looked round him at the great floor of upturned faces below. His own savage soul was stirred by the clamour, but only his gleaming eyes spoke of the fire within. He waved his hand to the shouting soldiers as the huntsman waves to the leaping pack. They passed him up a coronet of oak leaves and clashed their swords in homage as he placed it on his head. And then there came a swirl in the crowd before him, a little space was cleared, and there knelt an officer in the Praetorian garb, blood upon his face, blood upon his bared forearm, blood upon his naked sword. Licinius, too, had gone with the tide. Hail, Caesar, hail, he cried, as he bowed his head before the giant. I come from Alexander. He will trouble you no more. 3. THE FALL OF GIANT MAXIMIN For three years the soldier-emperor had been upon the throne. His palace had been his tent, and his people had been the legionaries. With them he was supreme. Away from them he was nothing. He had gone with them from one frontier to the other. He had fought against Dacians, Sarmatians, and once again against the Germans. But Rome knew nothing of him, and all her turbulence rose against a master who cared so little for her or her opinion that he never deigned to set foot within her walls. There were cabals and conspiracies against the absent Caesar. Then his heavy hand fell upon them, and they were cuffed, even as the young soldiers had been who passed under his discipline. He knew nothing, and cared as much for consuls, senates, and civil laws. His own will and the power of the sword were the only forces which he could understand. Of commerce and the arts, he was as ignorant as when he left his Thracian home. The whole vast empire was to him a huge machine for producing money by which the legions were to be rewarded. Should he fail to get that money, his fellow soldiers would bear him a grudge. To watch their interests, they had raised him upon their shields that night. If city funds had to be plundered or temples desecrated, still the money must be got. Such was the point of view of giant Maximin. But there came resistance, and all the fierce energy of the man, all the hardness which had given him the leadership of hard men, sprang forth to quell it. From his youth he had lived amidst slaughter. 
Life and death were cheap things to him. He struck savagely at all who stood up to him, and when they hit back, he struck more savagely still. His giant shadow lay black across the empire from Britain to Syria. A strange, subtle vindictiveness became also apparent in him. Omnipotence ripened every fault and swelled it into crime. In the old days he had been rebuked for his roughness. Now a sullen, dangerous anger rose against those who had rebuked him. He sat by the hour with his craggy chin between his hands and his elbows resting on his knees while he recalled all the misadventures, all the vexations of his early youth, when Roman wits had shot their little satires upon his bulk and his ignorance. He could not write, but his son Verus placed the names upon his tablets, and they were sent to the governor of Rome. Men who had long forgotten their offence were called suddenly to make most bloody reparation. A rebellion broke out in Africa, but was quelled by his lieutenant. But the mere rumour of it set Rome in a turmoil. The Senate found something of its ancient spirit. So did the Italian people. They would not be forever bullied by the legions. As Maximin approached from the frontier, with the sack of rebellious Rome in his mind, he was faced with every sign of a national resistance. The countryside was deserted, the farms abandoned, the fields cleared of crops and cattle. Before him lay the walled town of Aquileia. He flung himself fiercely upon it, but was met by as fierce a resistance. The walls could not be forced, and yet there was no food in the country round for his legions. The men were starving and dissatisfied. What did it matter to them who was emperor? Maximin was no better than themselves. Why should they call down the curse of the whole empire upon their heads by upholding him? He saw their sullen faces and their averted eyes, and he knew that the end had come. That night he sat with his son Verus in his tent, and he spoke softly and gently as the youth had never heard him speak before. He had spoken thus in old days with Paulina, the boy's mother, but she had been dead these many years, and all that was soft and gentle in the big man had passed away with her. Now her spirit seemed very near him, and his own was tempered by its presence. I would have you go back to the Thracian mountains, he said. I have tried both, boy, and I can tell you that there is no pleasure which power can bring, which can equal the breath of the wind and the smell of the kine upon a summer morning. Against you they have no quarrel. Why should they mishandle you? Keep far from Rome and the Romans. Old Eudoxus has money, and to spare. He awaits you with two horses outside the camp. Make for the valley of the Harpessus, lad. It was thence that your father came, and there you will find his kin. Buy and stock a homestead, and keep yourself far from the paths of greatness and of danger. God keep you, Verus, and send you safe to Thrace. When his son had kissed his hand and had left him, the emperor drew his robe around him and sat long in thought. In his slow brain he revolved the past, his early peaceful days, his years with Severus, his memories of Britain, his long campaigns, his strivings and battlings, all leading to that mad night by the Rhine. His fellow soldiers had loved him then, and now he had read death in their eyes. How had he failed them? 
others he might have wronged, but they at least had no complaint against him. If he had his time again, he would think less of them and more of his people. He would try to win love instead of fear. He would live for peace and not for war. If he had his time again. But there were shuffling steps, furtive whispers, and the low rattle of arms outside his tent. A bearded face looked in at him, a swarthy African face that he knew well. He laughed, and bearing his arm, he took his sword from the table beside him. It is you, Sulpicius, said he. You have not come to cry, Ave Imperator Maximin, as once by the campfire. You are tired of me, and by the gods I am tired of you. I'm glad to be at the end of it. Come, and have done with it, for I am minded to see how many of you I can take with me when I go. They clustered at the door of the tent, peeping over each other's shoulders, and none wishing to be the first to close with that laughing, mocking giant. But something was pushed forward upon a spear point, and as he saw it, Maximin groaned, and his sword sank to the earth. You might have spared the boy, he sobbed. He would not have hurt you. Have done with it then, for I will gladly follow him. So they closed upon him, and cut, and stabbed, and thrust, until his knees gave way beneath him, and he dropped upon the floor. The tyrant is dead, they cried. The tyrant is dead. And from all the camp beneath them, and from the walls of the beleaguered city, the joyous cry came echoing back. He is dead. Maximin is dead. I sit in my study, and upon the table before me lies a denarius of Maximin as fresh as when the triumvir of the temple of Juno Monita sent it from the mint. Around it are recorded his resounding titles, Imperator Maximinus, Pontifex Maximus, Tribunitia Potestate, and the rest. In the centre is the impress of a great craggy head, a massive jaw, a rude fighting face, a contracted forehead. For all the pompous roll of titles, it is a peasant's face. And I see him not as the Emperor of Rome, but as the great Thracian boor who strode down the hillside on that far distant summer day, when first the eagles beckoned him to Rome. That is the end of Giant Maximin by Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Greg Wagland For Magpie Audio 2021